Uh, prior stipulation, polling of waiving presence is noted. You may proceed, Mr. Harvey. Thank you. Are you familiar with classification of occlusions or malocclusions in human dentition? Yes, sir. Could you give the jury an idea of what those classifications are of malocclusions? Uh, you have three basic types, a class one, a class two, and a class three, and you have subdivisions therein. Basically, a class one occlusion is where the permanent molars line up in a certain relationship, like this. Okay, a uh, class two would be a classic example would be the Andy Gump profile, buck tooth, front teeth out, lowers back, so the molars would line up in a back position. A class three malocclusion is just the opposite of that, in which the lower teeth jut out over the upper teeth in the Dick Tracy profile. Is there a classification for crowded lower anterior teeth? It'd be a, a division under a class one, depending upon the molar relationship, how the molar is lined up. Okay, could, <clears throat> what, what would that be called? What, what are the different ways the molars could line up to, to change the subclassification? classification? Okay, well, I already told you that. How the molars line up, if, if the molars are lined up in an upright position, as I explained, that's class one. Uh, the class two would be where the lower molar is out f forward in the class uh, uh, class three and the class two would be where the molar was back. So as far as what we're, you're talking about, the crowded lower anteriors uh, uh, would be a class one, division one malocclusion is, is the way I would describe it. Now, in analyzing the bite mark, do you expect that the higher teeth in the plane would usually leave a, a deep mark? Well, the answer there, of course, would have to be yes and no, and that's, that's not what you're looking for, I know, but uh, it depends how the bite was inflicted. Uh, you can have a tooth high in the plane, uh, but if the person bit entirely with the left side of their mouth and the high tooth was on the right side, it might not even mark at all. So it, really the answer to that question is it depends on the bite. Without a, a model or a suspect to look at with just the bite mark, um, how do you analyze what, what made the mark? Okay. Are you referring again to a high tooth? If you have a bite mark which shows uh, for instance, deep bruising or, or dark bruising on one side. And you, you don't have a suspect, you don't have a suspect's models. Um, and uh, let's let's think about uh, the bite mark in this case without a suspect or the suspect's models in ring number one, the lower ring. Uh, without the models, what would it, what would you expect to have made that mark? Well, I, I went into that earlier and the answer to that is that one of two things you would expect. Uh, you would expect the teeth on the left side to be higher in the arch, or you'd expect the individual to have bitten harder or bitten, bitten at an angle in which they were applying more pressure to the left side of the, of the bite than they did to the right. And in this particular case, uh, we can say we can eliminate the theory of the high tooth because you have two bite rings. You have A and B, and when you go up to ring B, you can tell from ring B that the teeth are not higher in the arch. Well, <clears throat> when you look at ring B, could the same person with higher left <coughs> have bitten just harder on the right? <laughs> yeah, I would. I, I would think possibly that's a that's a possibility. Stated that I believe on direct stated that whenever you you have a, a hard bite with the bottoms, you expect a, a 
hard bruise marks on the tops. Is that is that what you said? I don't remember saying it. Okay. Would would you expect to see the marks from the uppers if you found uh, hard marks from the lowers? Not necessarily. All right. In relation to the picture of the bite mark that we've been looking at today, can you you stated that there were how many bites in the bite mark? Two. Two bites. Can you state which upper marks go with which lower marks? Not with any reasonable degree of certainty, I can't. And why is that? Because the lower jaw is on a pivot. It can swing to the right and it can swing to the left. And it also swings up and down. And it also swings forward and back. It's the only <laughs> joint in the body that will move in all those different directions. And it is, it, unless you're there and observe it, or unless there is a unique situation, uh, we can tell this, that the, <laughs> that the upper teeth and the lower teeth in both bites are consistent with the same individual. But as far as which of the lower rings, A or B, went with the upper bite ring that we talked about, no, I can't tell you. That's assuming that you're correct in your identification of the top marks being made by the two teeth that you identified. That's correct. If they were made by other top teeth, uh, they might line up or they might not line up. Is that correct? No, because that's... Uh, Again, a, a very hypothetical. That there in any other way that, that those three marks would have gotten there reasonably, except with those three distinct points. If they were made by these teeth that you had a picture of, okay. <clears throat> I'll let him ask. Yes. Just basically at the bite mark in this case, without a suspect, without a suspect's teeth. Uh, what what would you expect from the from the size of the lower arch? What would you expect in terms of? Can you make a prediction in terms of the age of the person who made the bite? Um. Uh, first of all, the prediction that I made when I looked at the tissue was that the individual that had inflicted that bite had crooked teeth. That's one. I'm about the age. You want to know whether or not you could tell the age of the perpetrator. I'm not asking year for year, month for month. I'm just asking if you could, from the general size of the lower arch that was depicted by the bruise pattern. Okay. Yes, you, yes you could. Okay, what would that be? It, an adult. An adult? An adult. I have a little drunk. Previously, say at one time that this bite could have been made by a large child. It's actually a prey. Sustain. Consider the bite to be a hard bite mark, a hard, hard bite. Yes. Ring one it looks to you like it was bitten harder on the left. Is that correct? Correct. And <clears throat> the right cuspid marks in ring number one. Isn't that correct? Correct. 
Yet in ring number two, it's not evident on the picture. Isn't that correct? Correct. And yet the bite in ring number two, you stated, appeared to have been um, done evenly. Is that correct? No, I said that it was probably bitten slightly harder to the to the left, but nowhere near as hard as the first bite. In other words, ring B was bitten also, I feel, with more pressure on the left than on the right side, but nowhere near as hard, and you can tell that by the color of the bruise pattern. Okay. Now, the question is, if, if the right lower cuspid marked in ring number one, and it was a much harder bite on the left, wouldn't you logically expect that the right lower cuspid would have marked in ring number two since it was bitten more evenly? If it marked in the one where it was a bit harder on the left, wouldn't you logically expect it to mark in the, in the second? No. Okay, and why is that? Okay. Uh, the reason is that uh, in ring two, there wasn't as much pressure exerted. The lower right cuspid is a protected tooth, and it would take a lot of pressure to bring that tooth into contact to make a bruise, to make a mark at all. And in the second ring, ring B, there was pressure to the left more than there was to the right. It really and truly wasn't an even bite. It didn't come up nice and straight and even in my opinion, but uh, it was tilted slightly to the left. And it's all in a matter of degrees. In other words, if, if ring B had been bitten as hard as ring A had been bitten, then you would have had the cuspid, then the cuspid would have shown. Can you state, <clears throat> let me ask you this. If you have three teeth, that align up in the same height and they're right next to each other, okay? And don't you often, if you have a scrape mark or a bite mark, don't you often have the, the two teeth on, on either side of the middle one mark and not the middle one? Yes, that there is a phenomenon where uh, you can have that happen, yes. And yet they're the same same height out of the plane. Isn't that correct? Yeah, and this is the reason why I told you earlier that uh, that would be a negative point. In other words, we know we have three teeth and one of them didn't mark and we certainly wouldn't rule the suspect out on that point. Again, what is a lateral incisor? What, what tooth is that, the lower lateral incisor? It's the tooth adjacent or next to the central incisor. Okay. And th there's two teeth in the middle, and those are central incisors, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. The laterals are the two right next to it. Yes, sir. Right. Now, in ring number two, which is the, the uh, second ring up, right, the one that wasn't bitten as hard, according to you, both lateral incisors uh, left two dots. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. That's on the bite right? Right. Now, since they both left two dots, wouldn't you logically expect that the two teeth would have been shaped the same? No, not necessarily. Without looking at a suspect's teeth or without looking, having a suspect's teeth in front of you? No. What types of teeth make two dots? The two dots you're going to get uh, uh, in a number of different types of situations, but but basically you're going to get the corners of the teeth for some reason or other uh, in a bite that is made more in a in a straight line uh, would tend to leave the corners would tend to leave these dots with a faded out area in the center. So the answer to the question is uh, the corners of the teeth are what left the dots. Is that what you would expect for both of those teeth? Well, uh, now you said I didn't have a suspect. Right. Okay. Well, without a, you, okay, without a suspect, you know, we, we, no, nobody has a crystal ball with these things. You look at it and you can't get down to the real fine nitty gritty uh, of it like you're talking about. Is there a chip in this tooth or not? Uh, what you do is you look at the overall pattern, the arrangement of teeth, and you make certain determinations. And the most important thing is to try and locate and identify what tooth made the made the bruise pattern. Was it a central, was it an upper arch or a lower arch? 
etc. And I went all through that earlier. But uh, just looking at the bite without a suspect, it would be, in my opinion, for me, I absolutely I couldn't make any kind of firm judgment on that whatsoever. So you, what you need to do to make a judgment on what made the mark, you need to have the teeth in front of you to try to explain. Is that correct? What you need to do in order to make a bite mark comparison is to have a set of teeth because you have to compare. That's what the word means. But to make an analysis of a bite and to analyze a bite and tell you certain things about the bite, no, you don't need a suspect. And that one particular point is a point that, in my opinion, uh, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't make any comment on one way or the other. In analyzing a bite mark, uh, before you have a suspect, do you ever construct diagnostic models? You know what a diagnostic model is? Yes, sir. So what is a diagnostic model? You looked at them right here. All these stone models are called diagnostic models. All right. Do you ever construct a model of what you would expect your teeth to look like? I have never done it, but it has been done, yes, sir. Did you do it in this case? No, I did not.
point out to the jury is that he missed the picture of Mr. Bundy's lower lateral side. And could you point out the, the marks on the bite mark which you say, on the second ring, which you say uh, match up to those two marks? Now the if I've got this oriented right, the left lateral incisor, and yours is saying left this part. No, sir. Okay, what are you saying? Left which part? Okay, the left lateral. Mm -hmm. and that left a two dots, right? And the second right. And then the right lateral. If y'all talk up a little bit, we'll get it in the record. Okay. The right lateral side, if you point that out. And does that, that has a kind of a point on the highest part of that teeth, doesn't it? Tooth? No, it's not a point. It's just uh, the teeth is slightly higher on the mesial than it is on the distal, according to that photograph. Can you point out the mark that you say was left by that tooth? Is that both of those dots there? Yes, it would, it would go from the, uh, the high mark on the tooth here, as you pointed out, the mesial. The high mark obviously would make it look a heavier dot than the distal mark, and it lines up just exactly. Okay. Now, are you saying that, that one tooth, which has two points on it, makes two dots, and the other tooth, which just has the one major, High point, but it also makes two dots. No, that isn't what I'm saying at all. Uh, what I'm saying here, where the where your bite mark is a lighter, obviously a lighter bite than than the, than the heavy bite on the first ring A. In ring B, your right lateral incisor, as you pointed out, is according to the photograph, slightly higher. It's not a point, but it just angles up. That left the mark at the end of the pointer. It also left the mark towards the distal edge of that tooth. And this is a phenomenon that we see. Flat teeth will leave it, teeth that are slightly slanted like this will leave it. But uh, in, in retrospect, having this to compare, you could obviously say, well, of course the, the, the mesial portion is gonna leave a heavier dot because it's higher. You pointed it out yourself. But what we're going after, I think what you're going after is the left lateral incisor that has the chip in the center of it, slight chip right here. And on the on the uh, the blow up of the bite you can see that there's there's two dots and a little space in the center. Uh, the same tooth, the left lateral made the mark here that you can see and it is it's far more prominent on the heavy bite where there was more bleeding into the area that there's a definite gap in the center whereas on the the opposite lateral incisor is more of a straight line. Uh, you stated that the teeth higher in the plane will, will leave a harder mark or a darker mark? No, what I, what, what I said, and you gave me, I believe, a hypothetical, assuming that the teeth were impressed into something like a media such as wax uh, and they were just laid down on the wax the answer then of course would be yes the uh, tooth higher in the arch would leave a mark whereas the teeth lower protected wouldn't leave any mark at all but you're talking about uh, a control how hard are you pressing how soft is the wax how deep are you going into the wax uh, all these things and, and we do this believe me when we analyze it, we take the models and we press them at different levels to try and pick these things up. That's in wax. That's in wax. Now you're talking about skin. You're, you're talking about a. In uh, this, as I said, is a is a static picture of a dynamic uh, phenomenon. This is a. This is like the automobile lights. I gave an example. Where you see the light streaking. Photographically, that this is what you picked up. That that's what the skin is recorded. That's recorded. What what you stated was movement. Yeah. That's here here you're saying here you're seeing this. And this and this and this and these marks right here 
mark right there, the, the, the longitudinal marks, uh, the linear abrasion patterns are movement patterns. And that's how it's recorded in skin. Let me ask you this, without teeth to look at, would you expect these two teeth, whatever teeth made those, would be of the same height or, or one would be lower or what? Okay. Without teeth? Without any teeth at all, this tooth would be a lateral incisor, this mark would be a cuspid, the mark from the dot here through this dot here would be the two lower central incisors. Now, the answer to your question is on this bite mark, on this bite mark, the, taking the whole thing into context, the answer is no. You would not expect it to be higher. And the reason for that is because you don't get the highness duplicated in ring B that you have in A. Based on the overall picture, what you would assume without any models or anything was whoever did this bit harder on the left side with more pressure. Well, I'm asking, I'm not asking about the left or the right side, I'm asking about the two teeth, the, the left central incisor and the left lateral, both left on, on ring number one, rather equal marks, and yet the left lateral incisor is much higher in the plane. Now, you stated that before that the one tooth didn't mark because it was protected. And yet the left, left lower incisor of Mr. Bundy's teeth uh, is protected by the left lateral. I really don't follow your train of thought at all. You're losing me. Well, that, then, then we're free. Yes. <laughs> um, this tooth right here. I'm not getting left and right mixed up. No, well, that's why I put the, the labels on here so you wouldn't get mixed up. Well, that's I need to see that. This tooth here and this tooth, this one's much higher. Now this tooth here is to the right. Is that correct? That's correct. All that's right. Correct. In this corner, okay, I'm looking at the right central side. And this corner is protected by the by the top of this right lateral side. Is that correct? Yes, but the tooth is out okay. in the arch. And in, in ring two, you've got a dot here, which you said came from the corner of this left central, right? But it's protected by the uh, the lateral. Right. So how, how do you, in, in, in one case, you've got it protected and it doesn't mark it. In another case, you've got it protected and it leaves just as hard a mark as the higher tooth. Okay. If you're referring now to the left cuspid, and I, I guess what I was referring to was the right central incisor and the right lateral. Well, now you're changing again. Now, you, now you're over to this side. That's what I'm trying to do. All right, do. you're not talking about the left, you're talking about the right, okay? I'm talking about this point here, which is over in front of the lateral, mm -hmm. which you stay and made this dot here. Mm -hmm. And it's protected by this tooth here with the highest part, which made that how come it marked? Is that what you're saying? In the well, I'm, I'm asking you, how come it marked just as hard as the highest part of the, of the ladder? If it was protected. Uh, it's out, if you, look at, if you look at the pattern here, the central incisors are out of the line. They're out forward. So, in, in effect, they're not as protected as the cuspids, which are tucked back in like this. It marked. There it is. You can see it. Right, and, but the only way you can explain it is by looking at those teeth and saying that it marks. Well, you can't explain it without looking at Okay, them. what you're saying is that based on that, I can't tell the heights of these teeth by looking at the bite, and you're absolutely right. I had no intention. Looking at a bite pattern like this on somebody, I wouldn't have any intention of, of trying to make a comment as one tooth is higher than the other. In this case, taking the overall bite into consideration and not hypothetically eliminating three quarters of it, it's obvious here that the person bit harder on this side and if I was asked later on now are these teeth to the left higher than the teeth on, on the left no because on the right I mean because of the two bites and here you've got a cross check one against the other if you didn't have this second bite at all or bite B and you just had ring A then we would have to say in all fairness that there is that possibility yes but since we have a second bite, then we can eliminate that and have there be two choices. And we're able to eliminate 
the high tooth choice because of the second bite. Okay, you can resume. through and telling Mr. Harvey about your educational background, didn't you leave out one portion of it? <laughs> Maybe I missed it. Aren't you presently attending law school? I completed law school. Have you? That's correct. Where did you go to law school? University of Maryland. You taking your bar exam yet? Not yet, no sir. When are you going to take it? Next week. Are you going to ask him about baloney? Yes, sir. <laughs> Just moving too fast for me. <laughs> examination and analysis of all of these models, you continue to refer back, Doctor, to the term configuration. That's correct. Would you tell us what you mean by configuration? Configuration is the shape and the outline and positioning. Of the teeth. Of the teeth, that's correct. So, whenever you concluded for the jury or told the jury that not all of these models could be excluded as having made this bite mark. You were doing that, if I understood you correctly, on the basis of the configuration of the teeth. Primarily, that's correct. Now, the children whose teeth you brought to us from Maryland are in the age group of, I believe you said about 11 years to 14 years. Is 12, that correct? Close to 12 to 14. 12 so. to 14 years. Now, you're not suggesting to this court and this jury that whenever those children grew up to be 32 years of age, that their teeth would look like they look right now, are you? I don't know. They might, they might look very similar. They would probably be more worn. They, they, they would, may or may not be more worn. They may be more worn. They may have chips. They may be missing. In fact, the arch size and the general configuration of the teeth will change to some extent, will it not? I said generally, as I said, they will get smaller. During the course of a person's lifetime, from the time that they're 12 to 14 years old up to 32, they acquire these characteristics of their teeth, do they not? They acquire them from the time they erupt. And then they acquire them on almost a day-to-day -day basis, do they That's not? That's right. Continuing change. Do you know whether or not any of those children lived in Tallahassee back in January of 1978? I would not the slightest idea, no, sir. Do you know if any of those children were in a nightclub called Sherrod's on the night of January the 4th of 1978? I have no idea of the whereabouts. I've never seen any one of the patients and no idea of their history. I have nothing further. Are you trying to say, well, is it your testimony that the, that the people whose models, uh, who those models depict their teeth that they are, would be suspects in this case? That didn't no, I never said anything like that, no sir. <clears throat> Have you seen the configuration that is represented in those models, the configuration of teeth like that before? Yes, I have many times. And Mr. Simpson was asking you about the individual characteristics of, of the teeth, all right? Now, when you looked at the 
Hi, Mark. Do you still have your transparency? Yes, I do. Are you, maybe we can look at this right here. little peaks and valleys that we see here or uh, darker areas and lighter areas when you look at a bite mark like that how would, what would you expect um, from the teeth of, uh, of the person who may have inflicted jackson now these aren't very good let him out to look at something you're speaking of for instance this peak or valley right if this were, well, I would expect there to be great discrepancies between height or a very light tap. In other words, what I'm getting at is if this was a tooth which was relatively flat, it maybe had uh, a normal projection, which was a, maybe a mammalon or a chip or something like that, which is projects about a millimeter or so above the edge of the tooth, which is, most of you know, is only a twenty-fifth of an inch. If something with a little projection like that hit hard enough to make a big bruise like that, I would not expect a little projection to make two distinct marks. In other words, it would take a bigger projection to make distinct marks. Now, maybe you can't see that in ring one, but ring two, we've got two marks up here with two dots. All right? And what would you expect from a tooth like this? If there was a, a valley or a small valley in the tooth and it hit hard enough to make that mark, would you? Uh, it was only one uh, point of an inch or whatever that is you said. Would you expect for it to leave a, a hole and bruise? No, I need comparing this a lateral in size around right. one. Well, whatever it is, I would expect pretty much the same thing. In other words, if I get dark bruises toward the edge, and no bruising at all toward the center, I would expect the same configuration to hit it. If it was big enough to make a bruise on the edge and no nothing in the center, it would be a fairly large projection. So I would anticipate that on this one would be two fairly large projections with a flat spot in the center. And on the other one would be higher projections on each side because they're bigger bruises with a lower flatter spot in the center. Now can you can you envision a situation where you explain that differently than what you just said? The only other way is that the teeth were high enough that you got a flaring out of the root on it. As it hit, it drove the blood out toward the sides. Could a forensic odontologist looking at a given set of models with a different configuration than you said you just said you would expect? Could they explain those marks differently? Well, that's the point. I'm getting it. Looking at models, there, you, there's not a way to do it. In other words, you try, you can't really get a correct conclusion by taking a set of models and attempting to explain what is in the bite mark. That's doing it backwards. Well, how, what, what, in other what? words, the bite mark is something which is, let's say, is the known, and the perpetrator of the bite mark is the unknown then you are attempting to explain what is in the known by an arbitrary unknown. In other words, you're taking a set of models which you really do or do not know made the bite mark and attempting to explain what is in the mark from those models. And it should be the other way around. You should see if what's in the mark is on the model, not what is in the model is on the mark. All right, and could there be different individual characteristics on a set of unique teeth which could make those same types of marks. There's all kinds of things that could make them. Uh, the force of the blow, I say of the bite, the direction of the bite, all of these dynamic things, because I said we're dealing with very elastic <laughs> substance, which is skin. And if it hits hard enough to make a bruise, it has to rupture blood vessels. Now, the blood vessels, which are very minute capillaries, if they're a small bruise, the blood flows. 
Now, depending on how hard the blow and how long it stays, the blood could flow away from the force of the pressure and flow around the tooth. So there's all kinds of things. I mean, it's hard well, how, how, how would you relate that to, to a tooth? Um, making those, those two dots, would, are you trying to say that a pointed tooth could have made the two dots? It's not as likely, because if it were a pointed tooth, I mean, in other words, high in the center, I would expect that to penetrate first. So usually the area which is pointed will penetrate, just like a cuspid is a pointed tooth, and we usually get a single mark from a cuspid, because that's the longest and that hits the first. Now, in terms of that particular bite mark, the configuration and the individual characteristics, including <clears throat> the lines and the dots and the marks that are, that are revealed in that picture, um, could you or can you exclude any of the models, not just Mr. Bunny, but any of the models that you've shown to the jury today? Again, one I could very possibly exclude, yes. And how about the other four? I don't feel I can totally exclude them, no, sir. And then, in other words, the other four consistent with the bite mark. Okay. <clears throat> okay, are the other four consistent with the individual characteristics or the individual lines of the bite mark? I'll let him answer that. Some of them are, some of them are not. Uh -huh. Is there, how many models would you? Can you identify the models that would be? I can say the ones that are the most probable, yes. Okay. Model number three is the most probable. And then beyond that, models number one and four are also similar, slightly less. All right, you can resume the seat. Mr. Simpson asked you about the models and whether they were, they were or were not in substantially the same condition as you saw them in the orthodontic clinic. Could you please explain to the jury why they're not? Objection. I'll let him answer that. The models that were supplied to me of Mr. Bundy had no 12-year molars or no what they call second molars and nothing beyond that. So what I did is the other models were poured up and trimmed down to be the same size model that was supplied to me of Mr. Bundy to make them look more the same. All right, now, but did you change any of the teeth that would be involved in the picture of the bite mark? No, the, the only thing that was changed was portion of the second molar. And uh, is the second molar reflected of it in the bite mark at all? No, sir, I see no second molar at all. You didn't trim down any of those teeth to make them look like Mr. Bundy's teeth. No, they haven't been touched. <coughs> I, know for, I mean, it didn't have anything to do, doctor, with the fact that Dr. Levine testified that they were 12 year olds that you brought to Tallahassee? No, nothing at all, because I knew those were young children then, too. You didn't testify to that? You asked me the age, and I didn't know specifically the age. The uh, models that you brought to Tallahassee, they had 12-year molars, did they not? I don't recall, really. They're here. I haven't seen them since they've been back, really. They may or may not. Okay. We'll get into that later. Right, that's all I have. May this witness be excused? Yes. Thank you. Free to go, Doctor. <laughs> Who is your next witness, Mr. Harvey?
step right up in the witness box, please, and raise your right hand. I do. Please be seated. What is your name, please? Wayne Hicks. What is your occupation? I'm an investigator. For whom? State Attorney's Office. Where? Tallahassee, Florida. Mr. Hicks, did you have an occasion on about January 28, 1978 to take a tape statement from Nancy Dowdy? Yes, I did. And uh, was she under oath at that time? Yes. And where was that statement taken? Uh, State Attorney's Office in Tallahassee. Okay, and have you seen the transcript of that tape statement? Yes. All right, do you have a copy of that with you? Yes. In order to expedite matters so as to not play the tape, I'd like to ask you some questions concerning Ms. Dowdy's responses on the tape. Yeah, and just have you testify to it. Yeah, we have no objection to that, Your Honor. Go ahead and get the statements in. Approximately page 7 of the transcript. Did there come a time in the course of her statement when Ms. Dowdy mentioned something concerning Ronnie Ng? Yes. Could you please uh, relate to the court and to the jury the substance of the statement that Ms. Dowdy made concerning Ronnie Ng on page 7? Uh, my copy here is not numbered with page numbers, if you could. All right. It's showing the portion that you wanted to read. Mm -hmm. I'm reading that. First of all, let me say, in the course of her statement to you, did she relate to you that Nita Neary had made a statement to her concerning Ronnie Ng? Yes. And did she state that this statement was made shortly after Nita Neary woke her up on the morning of January 15th? Yes, that's correct. 